Hello everyone, my name is Michael Jacobs and I'd like to welcome you to the science of the golf swing simplified. If you're watching this video, I'm sure that you know that I wrote a rather large textbook called The Science of the Swing. Along with my partner as an engineer, Dr. Stephen Nesbitt, we put together a full detailed explanation of the experience of what's called the golf club model. Now, for as long as golf has been played, there have been scientific efforts to try to explain a golf swing. David Williams in the science of the swing, search for the perfect swing, the golfing machine, the physics of golf, yet all had their own unique little ideas. There were simplifications involved and had a lot to do with the time that they were put out. The technology didn't exist to where we could take a true three-dimensional look. And that's what Dr. Nesbitt was able to do when he started his work at the United States Golf, Foundation, uh, United States Golf Association and the National Golf Foundation, is for the first time he took this into a three-dimensional uh, viewpoint. And when you go to 3D, things get hard to do and it's hard to uh, do the math involved to make it all work out. So what we've done is we've put together a solution to how the club moves in a golf swing. So how a golf club moves is fully explainable by Newton's laws. So the golf club is an inanimate object. We treat it as though it's a rigid body in our analysis and it can be fully explained by the laws of nature. So what we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna simplify this down so that you could understand it because it is historic and we're gonna simplify it so that you can use it in your golf game. So what we're gonna focus on first is the golf club itself and its properties. So let's dive in and simplify the science of the swing. Let's start with the first overall properties of the club. And a key spot is to find the actual balance point of the club. So if I held a club on my finger here, and find exactly where it's balanced, I can then estimate where the center of mass of the club is. It would be just somewhere on this line because the head of the club has some mass this way. It would be somewhere right there. So we take a little orange ball and we put it in that spot and we know that the center of mass of the club is somewhere right here. Now why does that matter? Why such a fancy word? Well, that's pretty much where all the mass is concentrated at that center of mass. So it's like the balance point of the club. So if I held the club at that spot, which you don't do when you're hitting a shot, and I push the club, the club would just move in response to how it's being pushed. But when I don't hold it there, and let's say I hold it all the way out here at the grip point like we do when we golf, and then we push it, not only does it respond by moving in a straight line, it also starts to twist and turn. So the fact that golf is played where we hold it at a distance from here, somewhere around the grip, it creates a golf club that not only moves in a line or a curved line, but it also twists and turns from how we push on it. So that's as complicated as we're gonna get in our discussion. When Dr. Nesbitt builds the club model, what he does is, after locating the center of mass, he sets up what's called a world frame or a space frame. And what that means is, if I'm in this room where I'm filming this video or if I'm on a tee box, when I take my setup and I'm getting ready to hit the shot, there is a setting that is defined by a non-accelerating room. So we have the directions of side to side, forward and, forward and back, and up and down. So by having something in a non-accelerating room, what he's able to do then is figure out how the club is moving. So that, that's important to understand. So when you set up to hit a golf shot 
and you're getting in your setup, that's why your setup and your aiming and how your body is in relation to the club is super important. Because if I'm standing way open, let's say, and the club is pointed way out to the right when I come in, it's gonna be hard for me to move the club in certain directions. So once we have this framework set, the next thing we do is we put three sticks in the center of mass of the club, and this is super important for doing 3D. So there's a stick that points straight out, which we call alpha, one that's on the side, which we call beta, and then one that goes straight down along the length of the club that we call gamma. So those three are at right angles to each other, and they move with the club as we swing. So how this is moving, in relation to the ground or whatever that frame is, we know the effects of the club and what the golfer is doing to the club. So that's how we start things. So let's start with alpha. So if I held the club like this and I pushed it straight towards the camera, I would be alpha forcing the club. You'll notice that the club responds by just moving in a straight line towards and away from the camera. So when I'm getting ready to hit a shot and I'm setting up, that alpha part in the early take back is in this direction as I take it back. And then as I'm coming down in the downswing, it's in this direction. So it's ever changing because the club is twisting and rotating around, but it's important for you to understand that the club is being pushed in this direction and that direction. And it has big implications on the lie angle of the club. Now, we know that we hold it here. So when I go to push this club towards the camera or away from the camera, I am creating a levering action as well. So I'm creating a twist to this. So when you're swinging a club and you're getting ready to hit a shot, understand that when you push the club away from you or towards you, by holding it at the grip point, the club is gonna wanna twist and turn like that. So that's our first part of force. The next part would be what we call beta. Beta sticking out the side here. So if I held the club like this and I pushed it side to side, that would be a beta force. Now, we know <laughs> we're holding it at the grip, like I've said a few times, and if I push it in the side to side, so-called beta direction, the club will twist and turn as well and rotate like that. So when you're swinging a club and you're pushing the club up like this or down like that and pushing the club side to side, you're also making it twist and turn uh, along with actually getting it to move in a, in a line. So that's important for you to know because I don't think anybody, as far as I know, I've been teaching golf for 20 years, I go back through the history of things I've read, things I've seen. This stuff was never discussed until Dr. Nesbitt and I got together and put this all together. So understanding that when you push the club in the alpha and the beta directions, the club is gonna wanna twist and turn along with actually being pushed side to side. So that's important to know. Now the gamma, along the club, when I pull and push gamma, the club doesn't do much twisting and turning and rotate. It does a little bit, but the effects are secondary. So when I'm moving this club around and I'm curving it around in my swing, and I'm not doing the beta forcing or the alpha forcing, as I'm curving it, that's gamma forcing. Gamma force direction is always gonna to be towards uh, what it's curving around. If you were moving a ball on a string and the thing was spinning around like this, that tension in the string, that pull that you're putting on the string to keep it curving around is a lot like the gamma force. So that gets quite large down at the bottom. 
So those three forces, review them real quick, alpha force, beta force, and gamma force, all three of those forces are summed together in the sum of the forces, and that gives us a linear response, an overall linear response to the club. But it's important to look at the three different directions if we're going to analyze a swing. So how does this all work? How do we put it together? Well, once we have the full idea of how the club is moving based on the world space frame, we can then create what's called the sum, that's a summation sign, sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And that's the classic Newtonian equation that I think everybody's used to. Once this is derived, we can then transpose this to our club coordinate system where these forces are then broken down into alpha, beta, and gamma. And it's those alpha, beta, gamma forces. So an alpha force would accelerate the club in the alpha direction. Beta would accelerate the club in the beta direction. Gamma would accelerate the club in the gamma direction. So by breaking them down into these components in a club coordinate system, we get the real-time information of how the golfer is influencing the club. Along with the three linear parts, the three pushing and pulling parts of a swing, there's also torque that you as a golfer can put into a swing. And at the end, we're gonna put this all together, look at some swings and describe how it, how it works. Now, if I look at the alpha axis again, and I take a club and I twist it around that axis, that's alpha rotation. So I'm alpha torquing to create an alpha rotation that you see right now. If I look at the beta axis and I torque a club like this, you're looking at rotation around that axis, beta torque creating a beta rotation. The gamma, pointing straight down, as I go to twist this thing like I'm um, uh, chalk in a pool cue, that is gamma torque, and it creates gamma rotation. So those three torques, along with the three forces that we described before, are the six things, the six inputs, drivers, that you can put into a club to move it. And that's the same six degrees of freedom that are in any type of um, rigid body when you're talking about the physics of anything. So you have six options when you move a club. Alpha forcing, beta forcing, gamma forcing, alpha torquing, beta torquing, and gamma torquing. That's it. Here's where it gets interesting when we start looking at the responses from these six inputs. So it'd be helpful if you reviewed alpha force, beta force, gamma force over and over, alpha torque, beta torque, gamma torque, and understand that there's a lot happening in how the club responds. There's the resistances, its moment of inertia, its mass. So alpha force, beta force, gamma force, not only linearly move the club. So an alpha force, as we just described, moves it in the alpha direction, beta force linearly in the beta direction, gamma force in the gamma direction, big part of the curving club. But those forces, because they're at a distance from the mass center, from where you're holding the club, also cause the club to rotate as well. A levering action is created from those forces to make it twist and turn. So your forces create linear responses and angular responses. 
Now, aside from those, your alpha, beta, gamma torques create angular responses. So alpha torque, beta torque, gamma torque are what we're interested in and how they change the angle when we're looking at angular work and things like that. So this is the most complicated part of it, to understand that an alpha force is going to create a linear alpha response, but yet a beta rotation. A beta force is going to create that linear beta response, but yet an alpha rotation. Gamma force, we know, has very little effects on the rotation of the club. So before we go into part two in the, and part three of this series, where we start looking at golf swings and piecing this all together, a detailed understanding of these six basic inputs and all the possible responses are what's required from the viewer. So this has been the most simplified breakdown in a 16 minute video of a very complex three-dimensional rigid body dynamic analysis of a golf swing.